name's Amy Harkham. Um, I had a proper job until about two years ago, but I've had a passion and a fascination for obesity, weight loss, eating disorders, dieting, as I guess most women have, um, since about the time I was a teenager. And left my job, as I say, a couple of years ago to research obesity completely independently, full time. Um, and the reason for it needing to be independent, I've got a longer version of this presentation, which is actually up on a website that I'll tell you about in a second. Um, and that goes into some of the conflicts of interest in the industry. And it's very difficult to actually find anywhere that you can study that isn't sponsored by Kellogg's or Coca-Cola or the drug companies, including the British Dietetic Association. You want to see their partners, and the Americans are even worse. So that's why I went out on my own. Um, we're going to cover some fun things this morning. Just um, to point out what the references are on the bottom of each slide, if you want to make a note of one website, it's called theobesityepidemic.org. And there is a tab called References. And what I've done is I've put all 400 references from all the research that I've done on that website with a click through. So wherever possible, it will take you to the original journal, the original website, the original um, conflict of interest or whatever. So all you've got to do is make a, a note, reference 54 or whatever. That's the one you want to look at later. It'll save you scribbling, you know, American Dietetic Journal, you know, whatever, SL 2007. That takes a lot of time. You don't want to do that. So that's the references. Um, and without further ado, let's spend an hour talking about obesity. Yes, sorry, sir. Can you the website, please? Yes, theobesityepidemic.org. I'm sorry. References. Yeah, there aren't too many um, tabs on there at the moment. We'll make sure this presentation goes on there. There's the longer two hour presentation on there already, just the slides. But Andy's video in this one today as well, so if you actually wanted to watch the presentation again, or if you miss something at 20 minutes, make a note at 20 minutes and then whisk it forward. <laughs> try, to, try to cater. Anyway, researchers at the University of Florida found that people would rather be blind, deaf, or lose a limb than obese. That original research was done in 1991. Incredibly, it was repeated and it was reported in the press just last week, and exactly the same findings were found. Now that is how badly people want to be slim, and yet we have two-thirds of the developed world overweight, and one quarter heading towards one-third obese. That doesn't make sense. Something has gone terribly wrong. And I'm going to put it to you over the next hour, but we have got the fundamentals of what we believe about obesity fundamentally wrong. Let me get this working. Um, there are two expressions that I've got no doubt you will have heard, and perhaps you'll even use them yourself at the moment. Um, I will have questions after, so there probably won't be time in the presentation, but do come and, uh, and pick a fight if you want, um, because this is the one that's most commonly used. Um, we tell people all you've got to do is eat less, do more. If you currently believe that, I really hope in about an hour's time you don't. The second thing we tell people is a bit more of the specific of that eat less, do more. We say specifically to lose one pound of fat, you need to create a deficit of three and a half thousand calories. Everyone in the room has heard of that, probably come up at some point in your training. Um, so using that as the framework, we're going to cover off calories, energy balance, thermodynamics, and then at the end, to make sure you don't sneak off early for lunch, we'll do the bit that some of you want to know, so okay, how do you lose weight and keep it off? because there is a way, but it's not the way that we're telling people at the moment. Now we need to get into thermodynamics, just quickly to start with, because if you say to a dietitian, why do you tell people to eat less, do more? They say it's the laws of physics, it's the laws of the universe, it's the laws of thermodynamics. They think they're all one and the same thing, they are one and the same thing, but there is no law that says eat less, do more. And they don't know what the laws say. So if you want to challenge any dietitians, um, go back to them and say, you know, which, which law says that, because none of them do. There is a law that was added in at the end. It's probably worth remembering why we actually came up with the laws of thermodynamics. During the Industrial Revolution, when we started making the first machines, and people were trying to see, could we make a perfectly efficient machine? Could you put a certain amount of work into a machine and get the same amount, amount of energy out of the end? And they quite quickly found that you couldn't. Energy is lost. You know, you heat the kettle, energy goes out the spout, the kettle gets warm, that's energy lost, and energy is used up in making available energy. You heat the filament, that makes the energy to heat the water. So those two things come into play. So they went back at the end and said, okay, we've made an implicit assumption, which is that zero floor. That was added in the end. We don't need to worry about that. This is the one that people think drives the laws of dieting, and they only rely upon one law. 
And the first law of thermodynamics, there are many definitions of it. This is the 1841 Mayer definition, which is voted in the world of thermodynamics as the best definitions. In a closed system, in thermal equilibrium, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it shall be conserved. That doesn't say energy in, energy out. That says exactly what it says on the table. Now, the body is not a closed system. We wee, we poo, we sweat, we are losing energy at all times. We are not in thermal equilibrium, although we are continually trying to get there. Some of you right now are trying to cool down because you just went out of thermal equilibrium. Um, but we do those two things. Now, the engineers looking at the laws of thermodynamics, that's fine. That's why we have laws. We know that the machines we're looking at are not closed systems, they're not in thermal equilibrium, therefore we'll put in a second law. And the second law is called entropy. It's also called the law of common sense. And what en entropy says is if the system is not closed, energy will be lost and energy will be used up in making available energy. And we'll see just how much with regard to macronutrients on the next slide. The third law we also don't need to worry about. Every set of laws has to define the boundaries because thermodynamics is about heat thermodynamics movement. You define the boundaries with reference to temperature. So you don't need to, to worry about that one. So what have we got wrong with the laws of thermodynamics? And I can see five things, there may be more. The first one is that the law one does not say energy in equals energy out. And even if it did, surely the corollary would be less energy in equals less energy out. If you've ever been on a diet, if you've ever seen somebody who's on a diet, the minute you start to put fewer calories into a human being, they adjust. And that's what the body's going to do. And to see just how much it will do over the next hour. Law two is the one that is the absolute killer. Because we never take into account more than the first law, and because entropy says a calorie is not a calorie, even Weight Watchers have just worked this out. November 2010 came out with pro points. A calorie is not a calorie. Bless their little socks. Um, some guys about 10 years earlier, and they were working with the right person. They had um, Dr. Jeffrey Libsey as part of their literature. He was working on this back in 2002 for the United Nations. And he said, you know, I reckon you should be looking at about 8.7 grams um, calories per gram of fat. So he was very much into this field. But another guy in the early 2000s, Eric Jeckier, working out of Switzerland, calculated how much energy is used up by the body in making available energy from different macronutrients, carbs, fats, and proteins. And he calculated that for carbohydrates, about 92 to 94% of what you eat is available to you as energy. And for protein, it might only be about 70 to 75%. Because the body can use about 20 to 25% of the fuel that you eat in the form of protein in turning that protein into what the body turns protein into. In many cases, building cells, and in the extreme, if you haven't taken in glucose, it will try to use that for energy. Although, of course, it will use that first. So that's one heck of a metabolic advantage for people following low carbohydrate, high protein diets. Now I'm not a fan of high protein diets, I'm a fan of real food. And I think humans should be eating food as nature delivers it and stop mucking around and taking the skin off and the fat off and um, you know skin this and that and the other. If nature delivered it as a whole food, we should be eating it as a whole food.